Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the UK leg of Adobe's Create Now World Tour. It's time to start the first part of today's show, and I'd like to introduce to you three gentlemen who have quite literally hot-footed it off the plane from Moscow, where I think the last leg of the Create Now World Tour was taking place. Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm and sunny London welcome to Rufus Deutschler, Paul Trani, and Mr. Jason Levine. Oh, full house. Well, hello. Uh, hello, London. Uh, it's been a, quite an interesting tour for us. We did quite a few cities from South Africa to Turkey to Russia. And today, we're in London to talk to you about Adobe Creative Cloud. And uh, let me explain a little bit what uh, Adobe Creative Cloud is all about. What we're seeing these days is a very confusing world around us. Um, you know, creation is very difficult for creative professionals to actually, um, they have to adapt the technology to their workflows and, and, and not the, the other way around. Uh, there's um, a proliferation of mobile devices and these mobile devices are not necessarily integrated with the creative workflows. Um, the creative processes, uh, like it's very difficult for graphic designers and video professionals and web professionals to actually share their work and ask for the opinions of other, um, of other designers, of other professionals. And then, of course, um, the apps and the services that we have access to uh, most of the time don't live up to our expectations, to the expectations of now. So this is why uh, it is very important for us at Adobe to actually uh, create apps and services that will help the creative community overcome all of these problems that we encounter in our creative workflows. So, what is uh, Creative Cloud? We launched Creative Cloud um, about a year ago in May in 2012, and we made a promise to our Creative Cloud members. We said there will be continuous innovation inside of Creative Cloud. And we delivered that. We delivered almost a weekly new feature throughout the year up to the, the new version that we're going to talk to you today. So we launched with uh, you know, all of the CS6 applications in Creative Cloud uh, together with Acrobat. And then in, uh, in June, between June and October, we launched Lightroom 4, which is also part of the Creative Cloud membership. We made updates to Illustrator. We made updates to Adobe Muse, to the Edge tools and services. And then uh, in December, we launched a whole bunch of new Photoshop features for our Creative Cloud members, uh, which made uh, working with digital images much, much easier. And uh, just a few weeks ago at Adobe Max, we announced our brand new Creative Cloud applications. We rebranded the applications as CC. So from now on, it will be Photoshop CC, Illustrator CC, Premiere CC, Dreamweaver CC for Creative Cloud. And uh, we will be showing you in these 90 minutes that we have on stage today uh, many new features that came with this new branding in these new applications that will actually be uh, available for everyone on June the 17th. So there's only a few weeks to go. What is Creative Cloud? So, of course, Creative Cloud is all of the Creative Cloud applications going from Photoshop all the way to, uh, to Dreamweaver, the video products. Uh, we've also uh, included um, InCopy, for example, in, uh, for the Creative Cloud membership. And then there is a whole bunch of apps, such as Adobe Muse, which we've created to let designers um, create websites without having to necessarily look at the code. Uh, there's, of course, all of the new um, uh, applications, you know, After Effects, Audition, uh, and you, you can see here also in copy. So this is one part of the, uh, of the Creative Cloud. But Creative Cloud is a much broader idea. Um, with Creative Cloud, we are also introducing a new way of syncing assets, settings, colors, and fonts through Creative Cloud, which is a really great feature because uh, Creative Cloud applications can be installed on two machines. Typically, it's an office machine and maybe a laptop, or office machine and uh, the home computer. 
and you can install the application on a PC or a Mac, or on a PC and a PC, or Mac and a Mac, and maybe I'm getting a bit confused here. <laughs> but you can, do, you, you can really choose how you can install the applications on your machines. And this new way of syncing these, uh, these um, assets, the settings, allows you to have your applications working in exactly the same way on both of your machines. So if you change your keyboard shortcuts on one machine, you can sync those keyboard shortcuts to the other machine, for example. But of course, um, what another very important factor in this whole ecosystem is collaboration. Uh, it is very important for creatives to be able to share their work, to showcase their work. Um, so maybe when I'm done with, uh, with a Photoshop document, I can then leverage Creative Cloud and show it to my customer. And my customer will be able to interact with that file, will be able to comment on the file, will be able to turn on layers and, uh, and, and look at different iterations of the work. And that, of course, works with, uh, with all of the files that you create with our Creative Cloud applications. So collaboration and uh, file sharing is available with Creative Cloud. Another very important thing is the community. Because most creative professionals, especially if you work alone, it is very lonely, okay? You're in front of your computer, and maybe you have great ideas, but maybe you want somebody to look at them and, uh, and give their feedback to them. So the community, um, the community aspect of Creative Cloud, which now includes Behance, uh, will allow you to share your work on Behance and also be able to gather feedback from other creative professionals, from a small circle of professionals or the whole community of Behance, if you so wish. So we have a new way also of meeting the community inside of the applications. And with Behance also comes a pro site, a personal portfolio. This is another example of value that is being added to Creative Cloud. If you go to Behance and buy a personal portfolio, which is called a pro site, that's a $99 price tag. And the pro site is now integrated and included inside of your Creative Cloud membership. So everyone can now create their own pro site on Behance. And basically, that's a way of showcasing your work, of creating your online portfolio. Paul will be showing some of that uh, later. Of course, then we need to publish the work. And uh, typically, in a, in a print design workflow, we would publish the work using PDF. We can now also leverage uh, digital publishing suite single edition, which, again, is included in Creative Cloud, and which allows you to create as many uh, iPad apps as you wish from InDesign, going through DPS single edition and directly to the iPad. And in your membership, you can create as many as you want of those files. And then, of course, we can publish the work to, uh, to the web. We can pub uh, there's uh, websites actually included inside of the Creative Cloud membership. You have hosting for five websites uh, on Business Catalyst included in the Creative Cloud membership. And then, of course, publishing video and all of these things is also made available. Now, all of this is the ecosystem. And to get that ecosystem together, we're also launching a new Creative Cloud app. And basically, the Creative Cloud app, which you will find in your menu, will actually let you access your activity, your files, your Behance activity, and of course, will allow you to download all of the CC applications. And from that little app, which Paul will show you in a, in a minute, you will be able to, uh, to update the applications as well, if you so wish. And this is the Creative Cloud. So as you can see, it's not only the apps. It's the, the, the ability to sync your settings between machines. It's the collaboration features. It's the community that is building around Creative Cloud and which is becoming a very vibrant community of creative professionals. The ability to publish your work to a pro site and, of course, to publish your work to any media, to any device from the Creative Cloud apps. So this is our vision of, uh, of Creative Cloud. Now, just very quickly, I just wanted to go through the various offerings that we have for Creative Cloud. It all starts with an individual offering. And basically, with the individual offering, you get 20 gigabyte of storage for your 
file sharing, for your file syncing across devices. Uh, as I mentioned, you can publish unlimited amounts of iPad apps. Uh, one very interesting thing is the ability to use uh, Typekit from Creative Cloud and actually sync fonts to your desktop. So I can now get fonts from Typekit and have them on my desktop and work, have them work in Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator, uh, all of the applications on my, on, my, uh, on my desktop. And this is another thing. I did a little math here. And um, um, I looked at the Typekit fonts that we're actually offering for the desktop, and I made a little calculation of how much that would cost me as a creative professional if I had to buy those fonts. And basically, the price tag would be $25,000. All right? And that's pretty steep. And again, this is a great example of how Creative Cloud membership actually adds value to your workflows. So you have access to all of those fonts, and you can put them on your desktop. Then we have a solution for Teams. This is a slightly larger group, group of people. And you get a little bit more space uh, in the cloud. You get uh, 100 gigabytes. Um, but most importantly for Teams is the ability to have centralized billing. Uh, for the team. And as a team leader, I can then assign my seats to whomever is working with me at any time. So if Paul comes into the agency, I can release a Creative Cloud membership to Paul, and when Paul leaves the agency, I can simply take it back and give it to somebody else. All right? So it's really centralized, um, centralized billing and, uh, and administration of the, uh, of the uh, Creative Cloud. And of course, that also comes with expert support in case there are some issues that need to be resolved. If we talk about a much bigger um, uh, enterprise, for example, we have solutions for that as well. And uh, basically, that means maybe having a, the ability to, uh, to install Creative Cloud using a federated ID or creating packages to deploy the software in the enterprise and, uh, and things like that. And of course, very important for us is the education and government uh, section of, of, of our offering as well, because um, we have very, very good prices for both students and teachers, so that students can learn the new Creative Cloud applications and that teachers can teach them. And of course, in all of these offerings, we have uh, promotions available, and uh, these promotions uh, can allow you to save up to 40% on, uh, on the initial year of Creative Cloud. Now, this is something that, uh, that we always talk about, the myth around Creative Cloud, because there are still many people who are telling me things which are simply not true. So I've made a list. I've made a list of things that people ask us uh, around the world and that are simply not true. So for example, the first myth that I need to, um, uh, to talk about is that many people think that the applications actually work in the cloud. Right? And many people come to me and say, Rufus, I'm never going to work on a one gigabyte Photoshop file with Photoshop running somewhere in the cloud. All right? So this is not the way it works. The applications are really downloaded to your machine like they've always been. They will leverage all the powers that you have inside of your machine. Another myth is that you have to be constantly online to actually work with your uh, creative software. This is also not true. Um, you have to be online basically once a month for a very brief period of time, just for us to check that your membership is still active. All right? So you, don't, you can go on a one-month vacation and still work on InDesign. I hope you have a vacation, but you can still work on InDesign or Photoshop or whatever if you need to. Another myth is that uh, Creative Cloud files cannot be shared uh, to people who are not Creative Cloud members. So uh, this is another um, wrong, wrong information, because I can share a Photoshop file with somebody who is not a Creative Cloud member. And that person will be able to view the file online, interact with the file, comment the file, toggle on layers on and off, and actually give me feedback. And these clients or coworkers don't need necessarily to be Creative Cloud members. The fourth one is that uh, people think they will lose all of their files if they stop their Creative Cloud membership. Of course, this is something that I hope that you know, people will not do like, very quickly, you know, like leave Creative Cloud. Mm -hmm. But uh, be aware that if anybody decides, decides to leave Creative Cloud, the files are yours. And actually, they're already on your computer. The only thing that you lose by leaving Creative Cloud is the ability to sync the files between your devices. 
and the Creative Cloud itself. Just a couple more. Um, updates need to be installed automatically. And so my IT department will go nuts every week or so when a new feature comes out, and uh, uh, the IT department will just uh, they've told me that, Rufus, you're crazy. I mean, I'm not going to uh, deploy all of these new features to my, to my team every, every second week. Well, that is also a misconception, because how it happens is that we make new features available to our customers, and then you can choose when to update those features. So you can go for three months, six months, without updating the features, if this is what you need to do. Uh, you're not actually forced to update whenever there is an update. I can't use Creative Cloud because my enterprise is behind a firewall. Okay, so there is no, um, uh, no bridge between my Creative Cloud and the Creative Cloud, between our Creative Cloud applications and Creative Cloud because I'm behind a firewall. Well, we have solutions for that too. We have switches that we can turn on and off and have a very close environment for companies that, you know, that need secrecy, for example, that don't want their users from Photoshop to publish work to Behance, okay, because of privacy issues or copyright issues for that matter. So we have solutions for that too. And the last one is uh, I have no choice but to buy the full Creative Cloud membership. Well, we've announced that um, at Max, we've announced that Creative Cloud is what we are focusing on as a company now. This is our future. This is where we're going. Creative Cloud all the way, all right? But there are still choices. You can either join the full Creative Cloud and get all of the benefits that I've just listed for you, uh, all of the apps, the, uh, the collaboration tools, and, uh, and all of the services that come around the Creative Cloud, or you can subscribe to individual products. So if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I only use Photoshop, which I frankly doubt because you probably use Photoshop and Lightroom and maybe something else. So as, you know, as soon as you have like three applications that you're using constantly, well, you know, a full Creative Cloud membership might be the good answer. So you can get single applications as a, um, a Creative Cloud membership, but you can also, if you insist to have a bo uh, not, not a box, but a, um, 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 a perpetual license on your software, we're still offering Creative Suite 6 as a perpetual license. And by the way, Photoshop, uh, Photoshop just had a CS6 update today. So we're still working on CS6, making bug fixes and uh, preparing CS6 for new operating systems, for example. So you, you have choices. Creative Cloud, the whole thing, or individual apps, or if you want a perpetual license, you can have Creative Suite 6. So why the Creative Cloud? Just four points here. Basically, the Creative Cloud, uh, we think, lets you work smarter with all of the apps because they're connected. They're connected with your mobile devices. They're connected with the cloud. They're connected um, with, with this whole ecosystem that I was just describing. And plus, with the Creative Cloud membership, you get updates as they become available. And this is really um, a great benefit of the Creative Cloud. You get to sync your settings, your styles, your fonts, your colors, and assets. You get to learn the new apps and the services because we have a whole section in Creative Cloud that will actually allow you to learn about the software, uh, looking at videos. And we've actually introduced a, whole, a brand new section in that learning uh, portion of Creative Cloud, which is called Creative Voices. And we have creative professionals talking about their creative workflows, their, uh, how they use the Creative Cloud in their workflows, and things like that. So there is a lot of inspiration as well. And lastly, with Creative Cloud, you can actually manage your collaboration. Like I said, you can share your files with your customers and your uh, collaborators, and that's built in the application, making it very, very seamless. So without further ado, let us show you how it all works. And we're going to move over to Paul, who's going to give us a little tour of that new Creative Cloud application. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rufus. All right. Cool. Yes. Thank you, Rufus. See, so obviously covered quite a bit. <clears throat> this is your cheat sheet. You can go to creativecloud.com, see those various notes right there. I see people scribbling down with, what is that called? Thing you write with? I don't even know. Pencil, pen? I don't know. All right. Nonetheless, here's your cheat sheet. You can see everything, uh, the different plans and all that good stuff. But I want to show you how some of this works. So. 
Again, I can get started for free, get trial versions. I want to click in here into Download Center, because this is probably where you're going to start. Okay, and you can see I can scroll down, and as a Creative Cloud member, I get access to everything, which is quite a bit, right? This is, look at this long list, guys. That's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Luckily, we can sort. So if you are interested in graphic design, I can jump in and check out these apps. And like Rufus mentioned, I could dive in, whether it's Photoshop, Muse, whatever the case may be, I can not only download it, but I can uh, learn all about uh, its various features, which is awesome. And we'll continually add to this learn section right here, including creative voices. All right, so again, I've clicked that download button for, say, Photoshop or Muse, and it will install. And this is the fun part that I get to show you, because it's actually will install this desktop app. And uh, we'll just start installing that program in the background. And I can choose to install more here as well. If there's, a, if there's a, an update to Dreamweaver CC, whatever the case may be, it will say, hey, there's an update. I can learn more about it. But it's all right here uh, on my desktop, ready to go. OK, so I can install it, go from there. Uh, let's go back to uh, my browser, though, because I talked about uh, briefly about um, the download center. But I also have access to my files pretty much anywhere. So I can take any file. And this has been available for a little bit over a year. But overall, I could sync that file to Creative Cloud. Okay? So I just dropped in that JPEG, and it's available to me. And as you can see right in here, you can see, say, a PSD file, your Illustrator file, your InDesign file, paging through the different page of a, pages of an InDesign file. In fact. You know, let's take, an, let's take an Illustrator file, for instance. It could be any one of these graphic file formats. Drag it in here, and it will sync to Creative Cloud. Okay? And it renders that out for me. Okay? I'm going to go beyond that now as well. Okay, you'll see that pop in here in a second, giving me that particular uh, file. But I want to go beyond this, because this is in the browser. And I showed you briefly this desktop app. So I've installed my different applications. Well, what I can also do is go to this Files section. And from there, I can open up that particular Creative Cloud Files folder. So I don't need to drag those files to a browser to sync up everything. I could jump in here, take that PSD, drop it right in here. It syncs that file like it's doing right now to Creative Cloud. Okay, So this is a PSD, might be a little larger. Nonetheless, that will actually appear in my browser. Okay, And uh, again, I can always jump in here and refresh. But the great thing is, is this actually lives right on my desktop. So I can continually work on this particular file on my desktop right in here. I actually have it right here and uh, make changes to it. And all I have to do is hit Save, and it will get synced to Creative Cloud. You can see that checkbox right there. OK, we'll sync up that file. Could be any one of these. You know, This Travel Spotlight PSD, for instance, I can open that up, and I can make changes to it as well. All right? So I can make changes to this PSD that happens to exist on my hard drive, synced to Creative Cloud. Here's that PSD. OK, it just did an update there. It did a little check as well. Gives me all those details, gives me all those layers. Turning on, say, that sidebar expanded, I can see what that layer folder is in this case. Jumping in here, I can say, hey, you know what? Let's send this to Rufus. Hey, what do you think? You know, what do you think? Awesome. Hint, hint, yeah. right? So nonetheless, awesome. awesome. <laughs> Got the thumbs up from. Uh, fellow, fellow artist, and uh, so I can get feedback from the client, whoever that may be. What did I not do here, guys? I didn't zip up this file and throw it in my email and send it off to him, and then he'd comment on it and send it back to me, and hopefully we have the right files. I didn't do that. Comments stay with my file, all right? And I see that working right in here. Check this out, guys. Look. Oh, look at this. Current version. OK, I just, I just did an update a second ago while Rufus was talking. And you can see it was actually the current version is showing there's a revised version that I can roll back to. OK? So it does versioning, which is awesome. 
So again, what did I not do? I didn't have to come in here and rename uh, this particular file to travel spotlight final, 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 no, I mean it this time, <laughs> dot PSD. You, you guys have those files, right? So nonetheless, you end up kind of doing that in this, it's nice, it eliminates it. And nonetheless, if I want to roll back, I can click on revised, and it will restore that previous version. I just did a text edit to that, but it's just something simple, simple right in here. It will change that particular file. So see how that font changed? Something subtle, I didn't have to send him a new file. This gets really important when it comes to collaborating with others, okay? So I'm thinking, okay, I wanna do more than you know, share a file with Rufus, which I can send him a link, and he doesn't have to be a Creative Cloud member. He can say, hey, great, that's wonderful, Paul. What if he wants to work on the file? You know, yeah, I can give him the uh, ability to download it, but I'd rather just take a folder and collaborate with him on it, okay? Just like I've done here, you can see those. Again, that's uh, Jason, Paul, and Rufus, I guess, right there. <laughs> but nonetheless, I can share that folder, and he can make those changes, and that's where that versioning comes in really handy. He can make that change, whether I like it or not, whatever. The, I'm sure I will like his changes, but I can always roll back to a previous version, and everything gets, is good to go. So I think it's really powerful what you can do, and really starts to change how you work. Forget sending files by email and all that stuff. It's all on my desktop, ready to go. All right. So that's the, the files section. Again, this is, this is coming soon later this month as well. Everything's up to date. I can share folders. Uh, I can view those files on creativecloud.com. I can uh, send out a, a, a link on Twitter and have other people, say, in the community, view my file. Um, but I want to go beyond that as well. I'll talk about two more areas. Fonts, which is awesome. All right, so here we have Typekit fonts available for me to use. So selecting Browse on Typekit, it will launch Typekit, and this is what I love seeing, guys. You're, you might be thinking, oh, Typekit, that's just for the web guys, right? Ah, oh, you're gonna go ahead and put that on a website. No, I like this, guys, look at that. Oh, what's that? Oh, desktop use. That's right, I can sort maybe by script fonts. I like this Coquette, I'm probably not even saying that right. Coquette. Coquette? Coquette. Yeah, I like traveling with this guy. It's French. Oh, it's French. Yes. So, so there you go. It doesn't matter. I can hardly know the name of it. This is the important thing. It's just whatever it's called, just sync it to my darn desktop. Again, I'm not downloading anything or installing anything myself. I sync it to my desktop. Coquette will now be available to me. And we'll give it a second, because as I dive right in here, you can see uh, all the various fonts that I've already installed. And we'll give it a second, but Coquette will actually appear in that list. And I'll show that later on as well. I can show that to you in my design. But you can see I have Adele synced, of course, being in the UK. Uh, I can yeah. jump out here <laughs> and... Uh, Pick any one of these, you know, any one of those fonts. And guys, I don't even have to restart Photoshop to start using that particular font. But again, do you think it's available in Photoshop? Sure enough, there it is, that Adele font appearing in my font list. I didn't even have to restart, all right? So I'm really excited to uh, have you guys actually try this because it's pretty powerful uh, what you can do. So. Syncing all my fonts, making over 600 fonts available to me, to my desktop. You guys think this is available in, like, say, PowerPoint something? Maybe? If you're using PowerPoint? Yeah. It's available on your desktop. All right, so for you PowerPoint designers out there, it's pretty nice. All right. I feel few, for you. Few show of hands. Yeah, a few <laughs> show of hands. We won't show have you raise your hands. <laughs> Even if you know for, uh, PowerPoint, you usually don't say it. All right, so let's move on. Because I've created this design, I have it synced, I'm using uh, the Typekit fonts, I can start to share this, and this is what I think is really cool as well. For me, personally, um, as a designer, it's nice that I can dive into, say, Behance. Again, right on my desktop, I can get inspiration. And I'm, I'm being serious here, guys. I will jump in here, sort through different works, and it's amazing what you actually see on Behance. It's like really awesome work for me to get inspired. I can view that content, but not only can I get inspired by Ink Studio, whoever that may be, I can jump out there and I can add my own work, okay? So 
Again, even if I just go to Behance.net, I encourage you to do so, you can see I've added works. And I've already gotten feedback on that work as well. And this is what I want. I want to get inspired, say, hey, I thought that was cool. I've implemented you know, uh, s s some inspiration based on that design. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but nonetheless, I can see I can get all that feedback uh, directly um, with uh, whatever I've posted or whatever I've added. Uh, again, to be hands. All right, but I'm gonna take you guys a step further as well. So we have all these, uh, all this feedback, and what you end up doing is, you know, building out your profile. Okay, and this is what I have. All right, so built out my profile, have my information, I have my various projects that I've added. Again, based on feedback that I've gotten from the community, which is awesome. Not like YouTube where, you know, it's like sometimes you post videos to YouTube and it's like, and if you read the comments, it's kind of you start feeling bad about yourself. <laughs> I know I do. It's really good feedback. I can implement that, but I can take this a step further because I can take my profile and turn it into a website. Now, Rufus is going to show you Muse later, but I can also uh, make a website using ProSite. So let me just click over to my ProSite. Again, I'm just going to roll over these various sections, and you can see I can change, say, the background, background style if I want to. I can upload an image. And the whole idea of being able to customize my particular pro site like I'm doing now uh, very easily. Again, changing the text, guys. Coming in here, you know, adding some text just like that, and I can start to develop this further. But you can see how I can easily change this content. Even jumping into, I don't know, let's see, fonts. Again, mention Typekit. Again, you guys are getting bonus info, because look, there's my Typekit fonts actually in my pro site. So that's pretty darn awesome. Changing that to Museo Slab, it will load in, as you'll see it in a second. All right, so this is the easiest way, honestly, to get a, a site up and running based on those projects uh, that I've got solicited from in the community. Diving into various pages, I can go beyond uh, my profile. I can, in my case, honestly, I've added uh, RSS feed from my blog site, but I can add a custom page, customize this any way I want. Uh, you know, lastly, jumping into settings. And typically, you might have a domain that looks like that, but you can always, of course, change that domain. It's step by step on how to do that. But at the end of the day, what do you do? You change it, you update your live site uh, like it's going to do now. Again, with that custom URL, which is happening right now, you'll see it load up. And in fact, if I click on this custom URL, I can click right there and it will load up right in here. So pretty, pretty straightforward within the two minutes I had to talk about that. Is that, I mean, hopefully you feel like empowered like you can do this, because you can. I can just dump, jump right in there and have access to all this fun stuff uh, all through uh, Creative Cloud and a lot of this content coming soon uh, later on this month. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Rufus. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right, so now we've seen a little bit about what Creative Cloud is and how the new Creative uh, Cloud app works on the desktop and how you can actually use all of those services and features that we make available through your membership. But now it's time to talk about some features that come in the new CC applications that will uh, be made available to everyone on June the 17th. So here I am in Photoshop CC. And the first thing I wanted to show is under the preferences here, the sync settings tab that I'm going to open for a second. And you can see that these are all the types of settings that I can um, sync between my two machines. So the preferences, even the actions, the brushes, the swatches, everything that photographers and compositors in Photoshop actually need to have on all of their machines. So if I make changes on one, it will be synced back to the others. And of course, there's also conflict resolution here that I, can, that I can choose from. And we will also see that when I say OK to this, OK, there's a little button down here that will actually let me know when is the last time that my settings were synced 
And I can then use that little button down here to sync the settings now, all right? So before maybe I leave the office, I can just say sync settings now, boom, and then when I go home for the weekend and continue working, because that's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can have the same settings there as well. All right, so let's show this feature here. And um, basically, this is something that we, we talked about at Max about a year and a half ago, right, uh, as a sneak peek. And um, this is something that may happen when you take photographs at a very low ISO or a very big aperture, like this movement in the, in the, um, in the photograph itself. It's the, it's the camera shake. So we have a new filter that will allow you to remove that. And the first thing I always do before applying any type of filter is to actually convert the, uh, the, the layer, in this case the background layer, in a smart filter. Basically what that does, it converts it into a smart object. A smart object is just a container with the original image inside. And this allows me to work non-destructively on my files. This is really important. So let's go here under Filter and Sharpen, and I will use the new Shake Reduction. And this window now opens. Let me just make it the right size. And from the blurred image, this is what we get. And I see people talking with each other like, shh, shh, shh. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Because now, I, I know, I know, this is not something that happens very frequently, because when you, when you take a picture, ah, oh, damn, it's shaking. Let's take it again, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, it can happen that you have this one picture that's slightly shaken, and this can save your bacon. Do you <laughs> save bacon here in the UK? Yes, we or save the bacon. Shaking and bacon? That's new. Sh shaking, shaking and bacon? Like <laughs> there you go. Saving the bacon. All right, and basically what Photoshop does, it actually uh, analyzes the movement in the image and shifts pixels around so that the image can be corrected. So I'm going to say OK to that. And I'm just going to do Command-Z, the original, and Command-Z again, the, um, the, uh, the corrected version. Now, in Photoshop, what we've also done is, um, is made the sharpening algorithm much better. And let me showcase that to you. Uh, what I'm going to do, again, what I will do is create a smart filter for that. OK. And under Filter, I will now go to Sharpen and use the Smart Sharpen. And we will see in this window, we have a whole bunch of new um, uh, options that we can choose from. But let me just zoom in a little bit, because the image here has already been sharpened. And I just want to make sure that everybody sees exactly how that image is being sharpened. So this is how it was before. okay? And this is how it is after the sharpening. It doesn't change much. But let me see. Let me. <laughs> Did that. <laughs> OK, the, the preview here. Come on. OK, let me just say use legacy for a second. For the, oh, yeah. That's how the image would have been sharpened with the same exact options in Photoshop CS6. Now, with the new, uh, notice the noise here, OK, and the really hard edges around the face. Now, if I use the new uh, algorithm in Photoshop CC, this noise goes away, and also the skin is much, um, much better looking on that picture, although the picture itself has indeed been sharpened. And of course, I can go in here and really uh, uh, like play with the amount here and sharpen it even more. And uh, I can sharpen the shadows and the highlights and all of these things. So very interesting new algorithm. And you will be seeing more of this this afternoon. Um, you will be seeing also that we have a new algorithm for upsampling images. So when you have a smaller image that you need to make bigger, we have a new algorithm that will allow you to have a uh, nice, uh, sharp and crisp image in that case as well. Let me go to this image, which, is clearly, uh, which clearly has a cast over it. And uh, this is something that I would like to remove. So let me showcase to you one of my favorite new filters in Photoshop CC. And again, I will go here under Filter. No, 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 not the Smart Sharpen. Let me just Command Z out of that, cancel. I'm going to create a Smart Filter, of course, a Smart Object. And then under Filter, what we have is the Camera Raw Filter. All right? So I can have any layer in Photoshop and actually use all of the technology that's behind Camera Raw and use that on images in Photoshop directly as a filter. So let me just do a couple of things here. For example, changing the white balance to this image. And uh, instead of taking it as shot, I'm just going to put it on automatic. And you will see that it 
does a pretty good job at correcting, removing that blue cast from, from the image itself. And then we have all of the tools that we have in Camera Raw up here. So for example, if I want to create a graduated filter on that image, I can do that right here and make the sky a little bit more dramatic. And this I simply did by changing the exposure in that specific area. So I can make it light or darker very easily using all of the sliders here. And if I go back to my little hand tool here, you see that we can access the, um, uh, the tone curves, we can do the sharpening right here, we can also uh, change the, uh, the, you know, work with grayscale images and split toning, uh, add effects to it, add grain and, and post-crop vignetting. Uh, I can even um, uh, change the camera calibration for that and uh, use the presets that I'm saving, all right? So for me, this is one of the most powerful filters uh, in Photoshop CC because I can use all of the power of the, these camera raw operations right there on a layer. But let me go back to this, to this uh, flower image because right here under File, what I can now do is share this image on Behance. So from the application itself, this image will now be optimized and it'll load to Behance directly from the application. And here I can, of course, add it to new work I can add a revision to a work in progress. I can give it a title, tags, and everything, and continue in the information module, the selection of a cover image, and of course, then the sharing. And in the sharing portion, I can choose whether I want to share it with everyone or just a restrict group of people to have somebody look at my work. So this is now integrated right here inside of Photoshop. And uh, it'll be, we'll, it, with, in the future, we'll also add that to Illustrator and InDesign to publish directly from there. Now, um, one thing that I also wanted to mention is for photographers is that uh, in creative, as a Creative Cloud membership, as a Creative Cloud member, you also have access to Lightroom. So basically, being a Creative Cloud member allows you to access Lightroom and Photoshop, and you have all of the tools that you need to, uh, to pursue your photographic activities. All right, let's move on to Adobe Illustrator. And what I want to show you here, let's actually start on this image here and go first to File and uh, uh, to the Preferences and Sync Settings again, and you will see just as a quick reference, these are the settings that we can currently sync directly out of Illustrator to our other machines. And InDesign will have the same uh, later this summer so that we will be able to do the same kind of things from, uh, uh, from InDesign 2. Here, as an Illustrator user, it's very interesting for me to know that I can sync symbols and graphic styles from one machine to the other. All right, let's cancel out of this and have a look at this illustration that we've created. And basically, uh, what we have in here um, are, are a whole bunch of um, effects that we've applied to text, for example. And I will show you in a minute how we exactly did that. But the one I want to point out right now is this vine that goes across the island. Basically, that's a raster image that I've put on a path. Let me show you how that works exactly. Let me move to, to this page up here. And basically what I've done, I've created this image here in, um, in, in Photoshop and uh, removed the background, made it transparent, and all I need to do now is to grab that image and go over here to my brushes and let it go. Illustrator will tell me, what kind of brush do you want to create, Rufus? And I will say, I want to create a pattern brush, Illustrator, thank you. And say, pattern brush, okay, like this. And then in this brand new window, we have the ability to actually choose automatically how the corners of that uh, line work. So I can choose auto-centered or auto in between. I'm missing this corner here, so let's create that very quickly. This is something that in the past would take much more time because I would have had, I would have had to create all of the different uh, pattern swatches before I can actually create the angles. And Illustrator CC does all of that automatically. So I will say OK to that. And simply by selecting these lines now, I can apply the newly created brush simply by selecting it, and here we are. And of course, the benefit of being able to use uh, raster images on vector paths is that I can then go in here and select a vector path, for example, and change it, and maybe change that line a little bit. So I have full control over how these vector paths actually, actually work. Another tool which is the introduction to another uh, interesting 
um, uh, concept that we've started working on at Adobe is um, touch-enabled devices. Now, we see more and more of these touch-enabled devices where you can work directly on the screen with your fingers or with a stylus directly on the screen. So there is a couple of tools that we've added to Illustrator CC that will actually let you um, uh, work in that sort of uh, fashion with your, uh, with your touch on the device itself. So one example is this. Uh, let me just show you what this is. This is actually live text that I can uh, change. I'm just going to change the letter just to prove to you that this is indeed text. And uh, uh, go back to this. And then use my selection tool to select it. And then under the type tool here, I have this new touch type tool. And basically what this allows me to do is to t select any letter in here, really, and start turning the letter around making the letter bigger, moving the letter around like that, moving the other ones back in here. And maybe this one here, I want to rotate that way and move up a little bit so I can become very creative of how this typography is actually laid out on my, on my canvas here. And let's do something like that. And the real benefit is that this, of course, remains text, okay? So I can make all of these transformations to the text and I can then also correct it if I need to do that. Is that pretty cool? Yes? You like the touch type tools? You will see this afternoon that there's, that there's a few others. But talking about Illustrator, let me just share my phone screen for a second here. Um, and uh, let me just share my screen here and go to my phone and turn the mirroring on. All right. And go here. And uh, uh, there's an application, and this was actually good because uh, uh, I was presenting this application, when was it, in Moscow just a few days mm. ago, and it, it was made available uh, right on that day, the Cooler application. And basically, what the Cooler application lets me do is um, walk around my environment and be inspired by colors, okay? And th by the way, this is a free application, okay? So you like the word free? Mm -hmm. And I can, I, can, I can go like this now and actually be inspired by the colors that I'm seeing. And at any point, I can... Oh, wow, this, this is going to make Cooler crazy, like picking colors <laughs> from Cooler. But let's say, like, let's see that... It's uh, like Inception. Let me, ah, let me just grab some colors from here. Right, okay. And then, and then I can block the image. And, oh, this is a bit blurry, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. And once I've blocked the image, I can then go in here and actually move my, my, my swatches around to select exactly the colors that I want from that specific image. And then I will simply say, OK. And the new theme was created. And I can then go in here and uh, call this theme, let me just delete that and say London. OK. And then simply say return, save changes. And that swatch is now being saved up to Cooler, all right? And the cool thing about that, the cool thing about Cooler, is that uh, it's not, it not only syncs back to Cooler, it also syncs back to Illustrator. And of course, to the brand new Cooler website. And let me just, and let, before I do that, let me just go back to Cooler for a second, because there's another thing that I wanted to show you, is the color wheel. Of course, uh, just like in the uh, desktop cooler, I have the ability here to actually define colors directly from the color wheel. And by selecting this little button on the bottom right here, I can say I want to create a series of colors that are complementary. So, of course, the colors will be from opposite sides of the color spectrum. And then I can go in here and choose these colors here and really create on the fly a new series of swatches that I can then uh, leverage in my creative applications. And uh, of course, if I'm, if I'm going back here and I say I want to, create, to take it from a photo, and uh, let me just go here to the camera, I can say download a photo from my photo library, from Google, from Flickr, you know, uh, and actually take the, uh, the color inspiration from images that others have taken. Maybe it's a very gray day in London, but I need some inspiration about colorful flowers. Well, I can go to Google and search for colorful flowers and, 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 make, and make a theme. So I'm going to cancel out of that and stop this connection here and go back to uh, my, my browser for a second. Because in my browser, I have Cooler open. And we've completely rewritten Cooler. So Cooler is now an HTML uh, page. 
And basically what that means is that I can uh, use the Cooler website on any device, on my phone, on my, on my tablet device, and it's also um, uh, responsive. So as I go down, you see that the layout changes, especially when I'm, ha when I'm looking at my own themes. Let's go to my themes here, and let's see if it's synced the, the London theme. It is, uh, it's not here yet, okay, but it's syncing. Let me see how, how this would work on a phone, for example. So it's, it's uh, responsive, you know, that's the way I would look at my colors uh, on, on a smaller device. And of course, if I create a new theme, all of these sliders here allow me to very, very quickly create a color theme right here from within the, um, the, this web page. And again, here I can say, I just want a series of shades of the same color, and I can select the color here and create the shades here. And the benefit of that, of course, is that ultimately, all of these colors are inside of my cooler panel in Illustrator, not in the swatches panel, all right? And that's also in the past, I would have had to take my swatches from cooler, download them, and put them in my swatches panel. Now, what I can do, I, I can create any type of object here in Illustrator, and let me actually change the fill of that, go to my cooler panel, and use this color here from the spring flowers uh, color theme that I've created, and apply it directly from the, uh, fr from the cooler menu, and without having to actually import it. All right, let's move to InDesign very quickly, uh, because the first thing that we notice is that InDesign now also has the uh, dark user interface just like Photoshop, uh, like Illustrator, and, uh, and, and many, many of, uh, of our other apps. In InDesign, however, we've made it also very elegant to change, because if I go here to Interface, of course I can, I can decide, you know, uh, I can go medium dark or very dark, I can go to light and have the, uh, the user interface that I had before, but in InDesign you can also be very precise. I want the 10% darkness. Okay, <laughs> if I so wish. So uh, people are really have the, the, the freedom to choose exactly how they want to see their interface. And the other thing that, um, that we've done, of course, is made it um, um, compatible for retina displays. So all of the icons have been redesigned for retina. And we also gave InDesign 64-bit support meaning that many of the operations, such as exporting PDFs, large PDFs, take much, uh, much less time. Okay, this is something that we don't think about. Many people tell me, Rufus, why 64-bit for InDesign? Well, there's a whole bunch of operations that run in the background and that need that sort of, uh, that sort of power to actually make it go faster. Now, what's the first thing that we work with in InDesign? Of course, it is the fonts. Okay? So we've done a lot of work in the font menu. Let me show you a few things. So, for example, in the new font menu, if I go in here and start typing italic, because I'm looking for an italic font, I can start typing italic, and InDesign will show me all of the italic fonts that are on my, on my desktop. And then maybe I'm, I'm remembering I need the Avenir. Okay, so I start typing Avenir, you know, without even finishing italic, I didn't even finish typing italic, just italic, Aven and then InDesign shows me these fonts now. So very, very quickly, I can access the things that I'm looking for. Another great new feature in the font menu is the ability to, um, um, to actually star fonts. Okay. Oh, well, maybe not this one. Let me see. Uh, um, let me <laughs> no. just, yeah, yeah, no, not this one. Let me say, maybe this, no, not the brush. I want something Bordeaux. Okay, I'm taking a Fran Sounds French nice. name just like you. Bordeaux? All right? Bordeaux. Bordeaux. Yeah, Bordeaux. Uh, Bordeaux, yeah. <laughs> so good, I can, I can uh, star this font because maybe that's a font that I'm currently using in a big project. And then up here, I can tell InDesign to show me only the favorite fonts. And this is my list of favorite fonts. Okay? So I have access to the fonts that, you know, that I like and that I'm using uh, frequently, very, very quickly from within the font menu. And of course, this includes the fonts that we've seen uh, Paul showing us that come from Typekit that get installed on the machine and that I can then use in InDesign, in Illustrator, in Photoshop, and yes, even PowerPoint. PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, so um, let me show you just another little feature that we've added, which is really cool. And uh, we've seen a lot of requests in, uh, in some countries about that. 
Uh, I wonder how London is working with these things. Let, I'm going to ask that in a second. But basically, it's the ability to create QR codes in InDesign. Are QR codes very popular here in the UK? They're starting yeah. to pick up? Yes? Not much, huh? Like, <laughs> but they will now. So I can let me just lock that layer for a second and create a new uh, text box here. And basically what I can do from the object menu is generate a QR code. And the QR codes basically, OK, maybe you don't know what a QR code is. <laughs> the QR code is something that you can, with your mobile device, simply go there and scan, and then it'll do something on your mobile device. For example, show you a plain text. Um, or a web hyperlink, or a text message. Or a yeah, text message will actually let you put in a phone number and then add a message that needs to be sent by SMS. Uh, an email with an email address, a subject, and the beginning of a message that people can leverage. A whole business card with your details. So having a QR code on your business card is actually cool because I can take the scanner, scan your business card, and it's already inside of my, inside of my phone. But let's create a web hyperlink. So I'm going to say HTTP slash slash creative.adobe.com. All right. I can then choose also the color for that creative um, um, for that QR code and say, uh, for example, paper. I want it to be the same as the paper, the paper background. And here we are. I have created my QR code. And now if I go under view and actually change the display performance to high quality display, we see that this is indeed a QR code made out of uh, vector data. So I can make that QR code as big as I need. I can uh, maybe change the coloring of that QR code. I can take that QR code over to Illustrator and do something else. So the QR code generation in InDesign is something that uh, I think we will be seeing more and more in our publications, on our business cards, and, uh, and on other collateral that we're um, allowing our customers simply to scan. All right, before I, I give the word over to Jason, one last thing I wanted to talk about is Adobe Muse. Adobe Muse um, <laughs> is so rapidly evolving that I myself am amazed at every time there is a new release in Adobe Muse. Um, basically, Adobe Muse is the application that we've created for designers that don't want or don't have the time to learn about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all of these things that developers uh, typically do. And maybe there's websites that don't necessarily require development in the background, all right? Because there's simple websites that can be created with something like Adobe Muse. And Adobe Muse allows you to do just that. Adobe Muse was actually um, created with a whole bunch of our developers that came over from the InDesign team to make the interfa interface very similar to the InDesign experience. So it's all drag and drop of images and text and widgets and the creation of the website. And of course, we can design the website, we can preview the website, we can publish the website from Muse. And remember that your Creative Cloud membership uh, includes five websites that you can host that you can add your own domain name and things like that. And Muse is perfect for that because it publishes right from within the app to Business Catalyst. You can also choose your own service provider. You know, nobody's forcing you to go to Business Catalyst. You can set the settings so that it FTPs right into your, um, uh, your own FTP. And then, of course, you can manage it. There's a few features that I wanted to show you here. And just let me, oh, before I go there, we have added also the ability to do tablet versions of it, phone versions, so various sites for uh, the same content or maybe slightly modified content. You see the design is slightly different here. But uh, let me just open um, a, a page here, for example, this one, and go into design mode. You see that we have all the familiar tools that, you know, for the cropping tools, the type tool, etc. And one feature that we've added is the ability to add motion scroll to some objects inside of the page. What is motion scroll? It's also called the parallax effect. And basically, what we do, uh, how we use it is from the effects panel, I can select an object and I can say exactly how it moves on the page and at what speed. So for example, two would mean the object moves twice as fast as my user is actually scrolling through the page, all right? So before I show you how that actually looks, let me show you another great new feature in this Muse uh, CC release, and it's the ability to actually use layers in Muse. 
So you can have things on your master pages that you can put on the top layer and then uh, actually decide the Z index here. Let me just show you that in Safari very quickly. And uh, let me go over here. And basically, what, what we see is that as I scroll through the page, as I scroll through the page, you see some elements start appearing. And check out the leaf. The leaf scrolls up twice as fast as, my, uh, as the movement of my, my scrolling, OK? So there's really cool things that we can now do directly from Muse, add these effects. And the last thing before I give the word back uh, to Jason here is the ability to go into, um, into the, uh, the management mode on Business Catalyst and actually allow your customer to make their own corrections, OK? This is my, my designer's dream, you know? How many phone calls did I get? Oh, Rufus, can you change tours in pours or soar in tour, you know? And do that yourself, OK? <laughs> and then I'll check it. and. <laughs> If I like that, you know, I can, I can then update the website. And basically, the way it works, let me just zoom down here a little bit uh, and take this word, for example. I can simply click Edit, or my client can click Edit, which is preferred. Uh, I can then change the text here. I can then update the text and actually publish it right back into my Business Catalyst website. Is that pretty cool? Yes? Will you be looking at Muse with close attention when it comes out on June the 17th? All right, so let's go. Check out what's happening in the video world with Jason here. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you. OK. Hello, London. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I've got so much to show you in the video applications. And really, where are my video users in the audience today? People can't see you online, but there are thousands of hands. And that's not surprising, because it's been a very big year for the video applications and for the Creative Cloud. And that is because, and we announced this at Adobe Max, that Premiere Pro is now the number one application, number one in customer satisfaction, number one in customer adoption. Does that sound salesy? Yes! <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> and I'm going to show you why. Because one of the things that we've done over the last year, one of the things that's allowed us to bring all of this amazing Adobe innovation to the Creative Cloud is that we've been listening. We've been asking, what do you want? What can we do to make Premiere, to make these applications better, to improve the workflow, to improve the collaboration? And it's these very things that I'm going to show you now in Premiere Pro. And we're going to start with one of those that's directly related to integration and synchronization with the Creative Cloud. Now, in CS6, we reskinned the entire interface of Premiere Pro to really make it beautiful, to make you want to edit. We darkened it. We added a lot more video, a lot more panels, just to give you video front and center. And we removed things like unnecessary buttons and unnecessary clutter. So we did a lot of this work in the source monitor, in the program monitor, in the project panel, in the media browser. But there was one area that was sort of woefully left behind, which were the audio and video track headers. And people said, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in these headers, and I, I just I want to be able to customize that. So now, when you go inside here into our little settings dialog, you'll see that you now have the ability to customize your video and audio track headers. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, again, for instance, things like toggle sync lock. How many of you use this button every day on a regular basis? For those of you online, no one. <laughs> so why do you want it there? It's clutter. Yes, you may use it. So you can choose to have it there. Or again, using the customizable editor here, I can simply select it and take it off. Like that. Oh, where am I doing this? Oh, it's right here. OK. I can also take some of my buttons here and remove some of these. And I can also customize my audio headers as well. You'll notice that we've added a few new things like mute, solo, and record buttons inside the audio track headers. Why? Because they should have been there all along. So this way I can mute my track, I can solo, I can actually enable recording right there. We've also added things like track level metering, right? Wouldn't it make sense to have an audio level meter on the individual tracks inside your sequence as you're editing? Yes! I'm very excited about these things. <laughs> so I can drag that down and add my track meter. And then I can also now change the way that I vertically scroll in the past. Anybody remember this? Click, drag, click, drag, click, adjust, click. Oh, that's the median. No, wrong. Ah, ah, I'm getting kind of old for that, right? Why? Why not leverage 
gesture capabilities, like something on my magic mouse, and it is magical when I simply gesture to adjust the heights like this, or I can hold shift and control and globally adjust my heights, and now you can see my level meters, and I can go back out. And the best part of this, of course, is that these can then be saved as presets. But those presets will go along with me wherever I'm editing, whether it's at home, on my laptop, in the plane, in the hotel room, late at night, in the dark, all alone. <laughs> or at a studio in Soho, because again, leveraging the Creative Cloud, I have my Creative Cloud sync settings, and I can sync those settings. So no matter where I'm editing, there they are, right? Significant. This changes the way that we edit, and this is a little something that we call editing finesse. Now, taking that a step further, all of my editors will know this, the media offline dialog. Again, this was a painful process in the past to relink media. And as we move into Ultra HD, 4K, 8K, the ability to relink and the ability to transcode and relink media that's not in the original file format that it was at first, ah, it was terrible. You didn't like it. And you told us this. And we listened. Sounds like sales and marketing, right? Yeah, yeah. but is it true? People online are going, what is wrong with this man? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I can tell you this. Now, we can select my media, which happens to be red clips. And I can choose to link it. And when I do that, now we have this very eloquent dialogue where I can choose to match particular file properties of my content. For instance, I can tell it to ignore file extensions. Because if I've transcoded R3D media, I don't want it to be looking for .R3D. It won't find it, right? These were the limitations of the past. This is what made it so difficult and so frustrating. So we wanted to remove those frustrations. So now when I choose Locate, what it actually does is it launches the familiar media browser, where you can now see I can, of course, resize my thumbnails, just like in the media browser. I can hover scrub over my content so I can actually see what media, what the media is that I'm looking for. Here's the actual file name, but again, I can just kind of look for these things. I can scrub over them to give me sort of context of the content. I can choose to display exact name matches. I can click OK, and it links just like that, visually. Seems like a small thing, no? But it's not, right? Who loved doing that in the file open dialog before with Link Media? Who loved that? Again, for everyone online, no hands. Of course, right? So you asked and we listened. And the best part is a lot of people may say, ah, you know, these things might have been in some of the other editors we were using. Maybe we've moved from those to you, but we want this stuff. Yeah, well, that's fine, right? That's what we did. We listened. Because whether you're transitioning from another NLE or you've moved over to Premiere Pro completely or you're simply augmenting your workflow with something else, that's what the Creative Cloud allows you to do, right? That's what Premiere allows you to do. That's what After Effects allows you to do. That's what Audition allows you to do. And Prelude, you can work with these applications from the Creative Cloud, even with other applications. Yeah! All right. <laughs> so, one last thing here before we move on to After Effects. Once again, big customer request. And as the years have moved on, we've talked a lot about color, and there's a huge focus, right? Not just to cut your story effectively, not just to edit your story, but to tell your story with color. And in CS6, we introduced Adobe Speedgrade, right? 32-bit floating point, Lumetri deep color engine, used professionally, wonderful, beautiful color. And people said, I would love to be able to take the color engine and the color profiles and presets and somehow use those in Premiere. And in After Effects, uh, in the previous version of After Effects, we introduced the ability to use color LUTs. Yeah? Lookup tables. So everyone said, ah, brilliant. Why can't I have this in the editor? That's ultimately where I want to apply them. So now, in Premiere Pro CC, when you go into your effects panel, I'll select my adjustment layer here. We've got some footage here featured by uh, Mr. Richard Jobson that you'll see later today with my colleague Niels. If we go down into the effects panel, you'll see that we have a new folder here called Lumetri Looks, where we have the various Lumetri presets that you will also find inside Speedgrade CC. So again, with my adjustment layer here, if I simply wanted to apply something like this bleach bypass, I can double click on it, and it instantly applies that dot look file, that Lumetri look, right to my content. Okay. But then there was that other part of it, right? Applying the LUTs. And for those of you unfamiliar with LUTs, 
lookup tables. Basically, these are just color presets, right? Color information so that I can take this, take a file, and just apply it instantly. And we have a lot of industry standard LUTs, many of which that you can download from sites like Technicolor and many others to apply a particular look to a scene. You wanted this. You asked us for it, so we delivered it. So now inside the effects panel, if I actually type Lumetri, you'll see that there's a specific Lumetri effect. I can double click on this to apply it to my adjustment layer, and you'll see that I have a couple of standard LUTs in here, log to lin. In this case, I'm going to choose this Technicolor one. Click open on that. And for this now, I'm going to leverage my fractional playback resolutions. This is what allows us to play 32-bit floating point color uh, on my laptop very fluidly, because if I go up to my settings here, project settings, general, I'm going to now turn on my GPU acceleration via OpenCL, click OK, delete all my previews, wind back, and now, again, using something called uninterrupted playback, not only can I play this in real time in full bit depth, but I can turn it off, and I can turn it on, and I can turn it off, and I can turn it on, and this is 32-bit floating point color coming to us from a LUT, which you could use in speed grade right inside of Premiere Pro CC. Yes! You asked, and we delivered. People ask me, do you work out on the road? I talk very quickly. Burns calories. All right. After Effects. Innovation. Things that you wanted. Number one on the list for as many years. I am now entering my 13th year at the Big Red A. And people have been asking us for all of these years, why don't you have, we need better integration with 3D, 3D objects. There's so much great stuff out there, but ultimately I want to be able to work fluidly. I need a direct pipeline, dare I say a live 3D pipeline from my 3D authoring application to After Effects. And now when you download After Effects CC, it will actually come bundled with Maxon Cinema 4D Lite. 3D modeling application where you can build your models, you can download models, you can construct them there, and you can now truly work in a non-render environment to leverage the 3D portions with your composited elements in After Effects. Now to do that, of course, we need to leverage tracking points. And if you take a look at the scene that I have here, this is one of our adventure scenes shot with an SUV in a field. And uh, we wanted to add something like a grill guard, something to cover the front of this SUV uh, via a 3D object. Now to do that, of course, I need to use 3D tracking points, specifically leveraging the enhanced 3D camera tracker in After Effects CC. So when I run that, what it does is it places a series of tracking points along the ground and on the object itself. Well, new in After Effects CC is that, oh, let's not choose our rotor brush here, is that I can now select a series of points along the ground, I can right click, and I can choose set ground and origin plane. This is the information that Cinema 4D needs to understand the ground and the objects parented on the ground, right? This is how it understands that 3D perspective so that we can accurately and properly leverage 3D on top of what is effectively 2D footage. Scrolling ahead here, what I now need to do is obviously create my solid where we'll actually place the 3D object. And it's really this simple. Right click, create solid in camera. And now I have the tracked solid along the front of my SUV. And at this point, directly from After Effects CC, export to Maxon Cinema 4D. I can literally export this tracking data right into Cinema 4D without a plugin. From there, I can also launch Cinema 4D directly from After Effects CC. And when I do that, it brings me into here, where now I can open up my tracking information, which I titled earlier, Ground and Grill. Click Open, bring it in, and now you can see we have the ground plane and our track solid, as you just saw moments ago. Now, at this point, I just need to merge or bring in my object, which is this thing here called Grill Guard. Again, you could have, auth you could have built this in C4D. Me, personally, no. So I downloaded one. So I click on Open, and then I'm quickly going to just reorient my layers here so that I can make some adjustments to the position. So we'll just realign and zero out my coordinates here just to bring the grill guard closer to my solid, like this, okay? And in just a few clicks, now we have the grill guard applied. Now again, in the past, we would render this out. And this is a very, very render intensive, long, you know, slightly painful, in the dark kind of process. And when you would get back to After Effects, you'd import that object, and you'd take a look at it, and you'd go, yes, no! <laughs> What happened? 
what happened is, is that in that old workflow, you were basically authoring these two elements blindly, right? Hoping that it was exactly right, hoping that your tracking was right, hoping that you were doing it and parenting it correctly and positioning it correctly and getting lower and lower as you talk about it. Is this working on camera for you? All right. But now, you don't have to do that anymore. Now you can see that we actually have the Cinema 4D object living right inside of After Effects CC. We also have direct access to the Cineware panel built right into After Effects CC. And using the standard Adobe Edit Original, it will take me back into C4D, <laughs> launching where you can now see that I've already composited in the video. I can take my rotation tool, I can fix and change the position here so it doesn't look like we got into an accident on the road there. Go ahead and make my changes. Let's just go ahead and reorient this just a little along the axis here like that. Okay, save it. And now, without rendering back to After Effects, wait for it. <laughs> it applies a live 3D pipeline, no rendering. And again, we can go back and forth and make all of these changes. And there's more. You have all of your layer access from C4D available to you from the Cineware panel, which my colleague will show you later, right? You asked, we did it. It improves the workflow, it enhances the workflow, and it's also worth mentioning, of course, that with things like your settings and preferences, don't forget that in After Effects CC, zzz, you have that here as well, okay? Tied into the Creative Cloud. All right, so two last things here before I hand it over to Paul. So very commonly today, we do uh, sky replacements or background replacement, right? So again, in this shot, as Rufus mentioned earlier, you know, we're in Hawaii and Kauai, and if anyone's been to Kauai, you know that a sunny day in Kauai, a blue sky, eh, kind of hard to come by. Limited window, always raining. <laughs> yep. So, what do we do? Sounds like, sounds like London. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do we do? Londoners, we replace the sky. We replace it with anything, because we can. And we usually typically do this with a technique known as rotoscoping. And for that, we have something in After Effects for a few versions now called the roto brush. And when I applied my roto brush, we basically create this very sort of uh, first level hard mat. And again, it's a hard mat because you can see that all of the twigs, right, all the little beautiful wispy bits of tree are missing. So if we were to composite a blue sky behind that, it's not going to look very good, right? It's going to look like, you know, you, know, you can imagine <laughs> my first After Effects project posted to YouTube <laughs> and just wait for the comments. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be great. <laughs> but really, it took me all day. Yeah, good job. Not impressive, right? People are so hard to impress today. Well, we figured, why not leverage a technology that we had in Photoshop and bring that to you in After Effects? That technology being known as Refine Edge. The tool is now called the Refine Edge tool. And using the Refine Edge tool, I can literally come along the edge of my tree line here and paint or trace along the edges of the trees, careful to include some of the background, all of the wispy bits, Again, tracing over like this. You can see I don't use a, a, a tablet because my hand is a bit shaky. Um, it could be the 17 espressos I had before the presentation, but <laughs> nonetheless, we're just going to do this like that and <laughs> all right, go into our matte view. And you can now see that we have this very wispy, beautiful looking tree line. And if we go into this view here, now you can see it composite in our background and <laughs> Trees, show it to you, full screen, play it back. And just like that, After Effects will propagate all the frames and give me a very nice, very realistic, very clean looking background using the Refine Edge tool that you already know from Photoshop CC. Cool? Yeah? All right. Last thing I'm going to show you here before we send it back to Paul. Now, an extension of that an extension of this amazing technology, was the ability to leverage this on footage that, um, again, we would have traditionally keyed with something, keyed off of something like a blue screen or a green screen. Now, in this case, um, and in the case of myself often shooting a lot of footage, I, I don't have a huge green wall or a perfectly painted blue wall to shoot and key against, so very commonly we shoot against a blue sky, right? We were actually in St. Petersburg the other day doing a show and the sky was this exact color blue. I even did a, a cooler profile from it. It was amazing. So I said, ah, yes, this is exactly what we could do today because that color blue really doesn't exist on in the human body, so it would be fairly easy to key out, so we think. So I grabbed my award-winning, Oscar award-winning effect key light, I took my screen color sample, I applied it, I had turned it on, and ah! 
I go all out, right? <laughs> yeah. That's actually what happened. Now, if you are a key light wizard, and there are many, there are many here in London, you can start going through the 38 user-definable, key-frameable parameters, <laughs> and you can fix all of that. And to that I say, good on you. <laughs> but for me, I can't do that. <laughs> so we decided, hey, maybe we should actually leverage some of this refine edging technology and put it into an almost drag and drop light effect to basically soften that matte. And my friends, I'm happy to show you now the refine soft matte tool. Drag it, drop it like this, turn it on, and ah, <laughs> smooth, soft, silky, beautiful, wispy, cleanly refined edged hair, just like that, drag and drop with the refined soft mat. Now, some of you may have been here seeing our seminar back in March, and I know some of you may have seen me at Max, and you know, I said at Max, it's one thing really for me to really talk about this stuff, but anyone who knows me knows that I don't just like to talk about things, do I, Paul? No, you don't. <laughs> I like to sing about them. So my friends, for my closing number, I present to you a little number that I created for you called Welcome to the Creative Cloud. That's not it. That is Africa. <laughs> That's my screensaver. Wow, this was kind of blowing my thunder here. All right, here we go. And welcome to the Creative Cloud. Sound, please. For this dream, since way back in CS2. Welcome to the Creative Cloud. Thank you. Good stuff, man. That's awesome. My gift to you is I'm not going to sing, by the way. All right. That was it's awesome. It gets better every time you it hear does. it. It does. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, the dancing, it's the now it's stuck in my head yeah. for the rest of the day. Sure. But it's good. It's good stuff. And it is awesome what you can do as far as you know, getting into you know, video apps, into design. Uh, here, obviously, I'm back into, say, this Photoshop file that I showed you guys earlier, because I wanted to point out that I am actually using that typekit font in my design, that co coquet, however you say it, is co right in there. Coquette. Coquette. My coquette font is right there. I can see my information. I can see the layers as I showed earlier. And again, just a reminder that you should probably name your layers. So if yours do they look like this, don't do what I do. It gets a little ugly. Nonetheless, I have control over those. And it exists on my desktop. So jumping into uh, my desktop, I can go to that particular file and open it up in Photoshop, continue to work on it. Okay, And this is, you know, and it's a web design is what I'm working on, okay? And I'm using Photoshop because, hey, that's what I know. I know it really well. I can create what I want. And at this point, I'd want to take this design and go into my code editing program, and I'd start want to, I'd want to write some code, right? I'd want to jump in here for the header. And it's cool that in Dreamweaver, you get code hinting for position, you know, whatever the case may be. I can start to type in, you know, am I doing, right? I mean, do you guys feel like this is a little, a little much? Having to jump in here is this, I'm losing you guys, I feel it, right? Yeah. It's like code and then all the eyes glaze over. Yeah. Like, all right, yeah. see? Uh, it's like, let's go beyond that. And luckily what I can do, and again, this was available in December, as well as available in Illustrator as well. But check this out, going to any one of these layers, whether it's a text layer, shape layer, again, just give me that CSS. Yes, there it is, copying the CSS. I'm selecting a layer folder. It's gonna take all of the CSS of all of those items. Select copy CSS. I go, I go take you know, half the afternoon off, right? Because what did it do? It copied the CSS. Uh, come back later, and all I need to do is click paste, and you can see there it is. All right, paste it in all that CSS. Cool? Pretty easy? Yeah? Yeah, yeah that's good, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's nice, Paul. This is awesome being able to implement this. 
I'll show you more. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for the guy clapping out here. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Do the same thing in Illustrator, but this is cool being able to jump right in here. And it could be Dreamweaver. Uh, it could be edge code. Uh, keep in mind, I'm actually in Dreamweaver CS6, okay? So just to point out that, again, it's been around for 16 years. We've loaded it full of various buttons and switches and knobs that do all sorts of awesome things, uh, but we've reached a point where we really wanted to modernize Dreamweaver, and we've ha we have. We've simplified it, only giving you that functionality when you need it. Okay, so we've simplified the interface, going from Dreamweaver CS6 to Dreamweaver CC. You can see that it is cleaned up, and you'll notice throughout the interface, we've modernized it. Okay, it's rebuilt, uh, retina, retina optimized, and good to go. But this is the thing I want to show you guys. Again, I got to show you it compared to Dreamweaver CS6. And what we've done in the past is if I've wanted to add a, a property right in here to this paragraph box, which happens to be this box right here, you'd go into the CSS styles panel and you'd try to pick, right? You'd go in here and you'd pick out what Marquise, I don't even know 100% what that is, yeah. right? But again, I see your eyes glazing over again, because what has happened with CSS, it's gotten so powerful over the years, and our list got super long. We said, hey, you know what, there has to be an easier way. And sure enough, there is. As I jump into uh, Dreamweaver CC, selecting that particular item, it's just that box that I want to modify, and I want to introduce you to the CSS designer panel. Oh, look at that, that's nice. Hey, look, scrolling down. Where's my long list of items? No, visually I can jump in here and I can change, say, the border radius, okay? So I can jump in here, lock down all of those corners, and you can see, again, new hotness by rounding the corners, very easily done. Even control over those individual corners, maybe making opposing corners sharp, and you can see what I've done there with that CSS, okay? And this is anything I select. This is nice because it gives me the computed properties of that CSS. Okay, it's like, ah, I could care less about the different classes that make up that item. Just give me all of the computed properties, and that's what appears right down here, easy to use. But I can go beyond that. I can go into my paragraph box, happens to be that class, and you can see that long list of various properties that you can add, but visually, I can add these properties. So scrolling down, um, adding, say, for instance, uh, any one of these, uh, as I come in here, uh, let's just select that paragraph, and I can change any one of these properties or add more to it or even just show the set. So again, from here, I can select any one of these properties and start to add to it. So if I wanted to give it a box shadow, I can do that. It's just a matter of visually selecting that, maybe adding that offset like I'm doing now, and a little bit of a blur. So as we see it come through right there, you can see I've added that drop shadow. Okay? And I can add more. So if I decide that I wanted to add a uh, gradient that might be specific to plat certain platforms, I can add that gradient and it will add those uh, browser-specific prefixes as well, because I'm sure uh, web developers in the audience are, are wondering that. So again, jumping in there, changing that gradient, I have that control. All right, so it's nice that I have this panel laying out all of the CSS properties that I can deal with. And that's what I do. I'd start to develop the site that way, just like I'm doing here, you know? And it's nice that CSS has advanced in such a way to where I could uh, start to add more than just, say, for instance, system fonts, okay? Just like I did earlier, I can go beyond system fonts or what's installed on my desktop, and I can jump down to manage fonts. So if I want to change this text that says gear up, I can sort through and select to add that particular font. Whichever ones I want, I'm basically making them available to my website. And of course, you can search on whatever. Sorry, well, maybe not everything. Maybe yeah. some things won't come up. OK. <laughs> but you know, again, selecting the font I want and adding it that way. I've just added it to my website. But now you can see here's that list of all those fonts available. I can select, say, Gravitas 1, for instance, uh, selecting that font 
and you'll see it load up here in a second. As you can see, it's obviously a different font. Okay? And this is why I especially love web design these days, because I have so much flexibility when it comes to uh, my design. Okay? I want to go beyond that, because I like that I have control over the visual look of elements, but I also like how I can add interactivity and animation. Okay, when it comes to web design. Okay, I've just created these nice little hovers in Dreamweaver. Okay, and that's perfect for Dreamweaver. It has a CSS transitions panel where I can add that. I want to go beyond that because this title, look, again, I want to bring that to life. Okay? Rather than trying to write code or even adding it in Dreamweaver, I can use something called Edge Animate. And I'm going to show you some new features in Edge Animate CC that are uh, really impressive. So again, this is what I want to bring to life. I'll launch Edge Animate. Again, just dealing with an HTML file. Take one of your own, open it up in Edge Animate, and start to manipulate it. And I'm just going to say, for instance, change the background color. Again, pretty straightforward. But again, I'm able to choose that color, and what gets written behind the scenes is all of this CSS. Okay, a lot of this code that I didn't have to write myself, it's just a matter of selecting that content. Dropping in text. Just like that. Again, just like we've done with a, a lot of the Edge tools and services, say whether it's Edge code or Reflow, which I'm going to show you, I have access to uh, Edge web fonts in any of these programs. So selecting that particular font, since I have this outdoor look, I want to add Alex brush just like that. Bam, there it is. Good to go. All right, I'm just going to turn on some other layers. So I happen to have this other text in here. Uh, I happen to have this butterfly that I've imported and some other graphics. Just for the sake of time, you guys know how this goes. File imports. I've imported ping files, JPEG files, GIF files, SVG. I can get an SVG from Rufus from Illustrator and bring it on in. So you'll see one of those later. But I like how I have full control to create what I want. And now that I've created this, I want to start to animate it. And again, I can scrub through, and you can <laughs> see some of this animation. Okay, I have this cool animation. How, well, how, how would you animate in Edge Animate? Well, I first off want to select all of these graphics, because what I can do in Edge Animate is I can group everything together as its own symbol. All right? It could be its own symbol, its own independent timeline. So that's what I'm doing. I want to treat it as one unit. I can convert it to a symbol. All right, title. Call it title. There's my title, OK? And you can see we kind of have this zoom in sort of look. We, uh, I kind of have this issue where I'd kind of like, I don't know, to control the depth of items, just like you can in Photoshop, I can drag that title behind the trees and that foreground and watch the R. Of course, it appears behind that guy. And now I want to start animating it. All right? So I'm going to, I'm going to show you guys something really cool, because I've shown animate before, but I'm going to show you this pin tool. All right? Because I have it in its final position. All right? So I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to turn on this toggle pin happens to be this little blue line right here. And I can say, hey, you know what? Four seconds down, just pin the current position of this title right four seconds in. Just pin that content. Pin it there. And now I can have fun, because I can take this. Now that it has established its final position right there, I can have fun, maybe scale it down, uh, maybe have it fade in anything that I want, maybe move it uh, down as well, and it's created that animation, OK? And this is how you'd work as an animator. A lot of times you build your final scene, <coughs> and then you kind of animate backwards, and that's exactly what that pin tool does, all right? So you can see, scrubbing in, it creates that sort of animation. Um, I might want to add more to it. We've done a lot by way of web standards. Uh, we've championed web standards, especially around filters, which I love, because what if I wanted to create some depth? I want those, these trees to start out blurry, and then they'll get sharp as they zoom in. Well, sure enough, I can adjust the blur. OK, you see what I'm doing there? I'm adjusting the blur. And anything in this panel, I can animate. So I've basically 
animated the blur now as we move in just like that. Cool? Pretty, pretty easily done. All right. So that's the pin tool. Check that out. Very powerful. I'm going to go beyond that because now I want to animate this fun butterfly. You know I was going to, right? You knew I had to. It's like, you know what? It's a butterfly. It seems to be flapping its wings, but it's not going anywhere. Right? So what would we do? We'd maybe take this uh, you know, object and move it from point A to point B over the course of three seconds. Uh, but we know that butterflies don't really fly that way. At least none of the butterflies I know no. really work no, that way. No. So you, I don't know. Yeah. So nonetheless, let's have it travel maybe through a certain motion path that I can establish. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. It might start here, and oh, look right over here. A oh, motion pass. Selecting that, it will add uh, that particular uh, motion path when I'm ready to animate. So starting off to the side right here, maybe right about there, scrubbing in two and a half seconds or so, moving it from point A to point B just like I did before, and I love actually seeing this little icon, right? Pen tool, that's my friend, right? Bam, curving it any way I want. Again, having this ease, and keep in mind, it's, this is web standards code that it's making. So I, rather than me writing all this crazy JavaScript, I'm just manipulating a line. And you can see that butterfly fly. So we'll just run this, and we'll see it work in a browser. You can see how it, he's flying across the screen. Okay, Was that easy? Pretty easy? Draw a line, any path. You can see you can... Maybe that guy should be, he should be, plus he should, he's, I hit the, I, he hit the white wall. I can't get past that white wall. And uh, nonetheless, I can animate him off. But I'm thinking, again, you get excited about this stuff. You're like, hey, this is the web. I can add this interactivity, and this is fun, and animation. So let's have some interactivity to this. I want to be able to touch this butterfly uh, and have it animate. So I can do that, jumping into this particular project, in fact, Let's take a look at uh, this version I have. Same sort of motion path. Uh, you'll see that follow. But what I can do is I can say, hey, you know what? For this timeline, you know what? Don't autoplay. Don't automatically start flying away. Turn that off. I want to instead, when you touch that butterfly, just as they do, as soon as I touch them, I want it to play that timeline. So over here, as soon as you touch that butterfly, it's going to play that timeline, adding that code right here, it's going to play that timeline. Okay, I can add more to it as well. I can start to uh, make the wings flap as well, because that happens to be inside of that butterfly symbol. As you can see, that's its name. Say, so, hey, make those wings flap inside, just like I'm doing right now. That same line of code, play, and it will fly when you touch it. But I do have to make sure, again, it's not going to start initially, so turn off autoplay. When you touch it, it's going to play this timeline as well as the wings flapping inside of that particular uh, butterfly. Again, I'll just run this in a browser. So we'll see this work. He's still, and then we touch him, and he flies away. That's fun, right? It's nice being able to do this and bring this content to life, right? Because this isn't, this isn't print. There's so much more that we can do. And even going beyond that, you can start to see how you can start to lay out entire uh, sections to sites, whether I have this entire title, and when you click on it, maybe it plays into the next section. Maybe you add some more uh, JavaScript in this case uh, for some of these elements, such as uh, you know, any one of these butterflies. I can start to even add random movement here as well. So as soon as you touch it, just go ahead and play some random, just pasting in some code. Again, this is largely for um, if you're familiar with ActionScript. And I, I don't have time to show Flash, but we've rebuilt it 64-bit from the ground up. It works great. But this, is, this looks just like ActionScript, yet it's JavaScript. And, um, it will enable me to add random movement to that particular butterfly. So running this, you'll see this animation take place. Touch him, he flies away. I think the hiker should be a little bit more freaked out as to the size of that butterfly. It's huge. It's like he's coming straight for me. Yeah. Clicking, 
and it plays that next section. Okay, again, that's an SVG map. I'm touching these different butterflies, and they fly away randomly moving. All right, and that's exactly what's happening here. As I try to touch them, he's moving all these different directions. And also, what we can do is I click. I can even add, say, a Twitter feed. So there's really a lot you can do, even in a developer's hands. Don't think this is just for designers, because I'm pulling in a Twitter feed from today's event. So please, uh, we're checking that out, that hashtag. So, All right, so that's what I can do, all with Edge Animate. I did mention Reflow, so I just have a, a minute to talk about it as well. Uh, and again, <clears throat> I can still use uh, Photoshop, that's great, but again, it's pixel precision is what's awesome about it. But I want my content to reflow, all right? I want it to change based on the screen size. So uh, just an example of this you might experience is, again, when it comes to web development, how do you plan for all these different screens? So you might have a desktop you have to plan your website for. And I'll just scale this down. This is a desktop. You know, that's turning into a laptop. You've got to start planning for laptops. OK, how does my content look? Still smaller laptops. So it could be a tablet as well. OK, a tablet, yeah, that's what I said, a tablet, guys. <laughs> and that could also be not only horizontal, but vertical as well. Sideways, again, complexity we're adding, scaling this down. And it could even be, of course, a phone. And that's how you feel at the end of the day. It's like, ah, my website just went from you know, this to this. How do I get there, right? Stay with me, because I'm going to make it easy for you. Reflow. At opening up Reflow, I have the ability to create graphics all visually all with CSS, even as I draw out this box, you can see I'm able to create items that are solely CSS that I can copy and paste and put everywhere. All right, I can add those graphics, which is exactly what you'd get uh, as I open up this um, more baked version. Because what I'd want to do is add graphics and design everything using CSS, okay? So loading up this, you can see this particular layout. And as I scale it down, you can see the layout changing for those different screen sizes. So I can easily come in here, say 300 pixels wide, and I can add another breakpoint. So I've just add, added another breakpoint right here, and then I can change this content all I want. I didn't make another Photoshop file. I've just added a breakpoint, which is a media query, and then I have control over this layout. So I can come in here and change that particular color if I want to. Okay, and it's just changed for that screen size, all right? That's what I want to do, is work this way with my one file and see my content change, all right? But the issue is, is how do I see this on my device? I ultimately want to test this out on my device. Luckily, we have something called Edge Inspect, okay? And we have this hook into Edge Inspect, saying, hey, you know what? You can connect, say, your iPhone in this case, uh, iPad, any tablet device, Android device. You can connect it just like that. So uh, if I just open this up, you can see that I actually have Thanks to Edge Inspect, I have this connection with my device. And this is the cool thing I love, because I'm thinking, OK, this, this title is a little washed out. Well, I can change any property in here, and it will actually, again, I'll just have to refresh it, but it'll actually change uh, on my device as well. Let me actually, ooh, you know what the issue is, is right in here. So if I take this and just change this to white, you could see it changes to white, OK? Do you guys see what I'm doing there? Changing this layout. Change it to red if I want. Just making sure it pops on this device. What did I not do? I didn't upload any code to any web server and have to go to my darn device and refresh that content. And scrolling down, this is, this is browser content. I can see how this looks. I can change it uh, any way I want, literally selecting it and then changing those properties, maybe making it 100%. Again, real subtle, but that's the control I want when it comes to mobile design. Cool, guys? Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to wrap it up. Terrific. Good stuff, guys. Um, I'm, I'm blown away by a lot of that, as I'm sure you guys out there. So uh, please join me one more time in thanking Rufus Deutschler, Paul Trani, and Mr. Jason Levy. Thank you. Thank you, guys.